Welcome to Capitol Hill. Well, the government put a new set of amendments to change the Migration Act to the opposition leader, Tony Abbott, today. But Mr Abbott has said no. He wants changes to only apply to offshore processing in third countries, which are signatories to the United Nations Convention on Refugees. That would rule in Nauru, but rule out Malaysia. Joining me to discuss the day's, day's events and a bit more besides, a Labor Senator, Trish Crossan, and CLP Senator Nigel Scullion. Welcome to you both. Good to be here. Nigel, the opposition leader, Tony Abbott, wants to change the amendments to the Migration Act to ensure countries that are signatories to the Convention on Refugees are the only ones where offshore processing can take place. Wasn't that always the place you were going to end up? Well, it's the only decent and reasonable place to end up. I mean, one of the things about either being a signatory to the 51 Convention or the 67 Protocol means that the, the principle of reformal is, is the principle that we're talking about and, and we believe in non reformat and that's the process of not returning somewhere, someone to the place under which they were persecuted. Now, so to, so to keep people in, third, in, in, in a third party country or nation uh, that doesn't, isn't a signatory does not afford that protection. Uh, and so Malaysia, until they sign either Protocol or the uh, 51 Convention, which, which they are welcome to do, and who knows what they will do. Nauru, I understand, will be a signatory on the 26th of September. Um, and that is obviously what we consider will provide protection, the, the quite right and proper protections for people under both the Convention and the Protocol. And uh, I, I think it's an amendment uh, that should give every Australian some comfort that people are being... we are. We are staying well within the bounds of the, the international convention about the treatment of refugees uh, and Australia can guarantee in that sense that the tr that refugees that we treat offshore and offshore processing is something that we very much support. The reason we support that because it is a genuine disincentive and we believe that these amendments uh, will provide for uh, allowing uh, the government to select Nauru. I mean, Nauru now has the but president of Nauru saying, yes, we'd be very interested in doing this. But when, when John Howard had the Pacific solution, which is lauded on your side of yep. politics, mm -hmm. even when Tony Abbott went to the election asking, telling Julia Gillard to pick up the phone to mm -hmm. Nauru, Nauru was not a signatory to the UN mm -hmm. Convention on Refugees. Why, why was it OK then for Nauru not to be a signatory, but not OK now? Well, probably for a couple of reasons. I think it needs to be well understood that the International Organisation for Migration were acting on Australia's behalf in terms of providing uh, all the logistical and uh, uh, refugee processing that was actually happening on Nauru. And so we had a great deal of control over the security, uh, the processing. We had, we had an international organisation on migration providing for all of those things. So... Um, Whilst we always thought Nauru was an excellent uh, uh, process, and we have been obviously the ones in this discussion that has encouraged Nauru to get, if you like, um, uh, certification, if you like, international certification for the standards that we'd like them to prescribe to. Trish, you need the opposition to vote for you on this one. It's clear you're not going to get them to back any solution that allows the option of Malaysia for processing. Is it time to drop the Malaysian option? Well, I think this is where we need to uh, actually understand the process we've gone through in the last week, an extensive process. So we had a policy position taken in our caucus. On Friday, we then saw the first cut of legislation that implements that policy position. Uh, and today, we've had further discussions with the opposition and we realise that there are some amendments that need to be made to that legislation and those amendments are now doing the rounds of our party and both the opposition. And those amendments go to exactly what Nigel was talking about, the ability to ensure that the non-reformant is, is actually there for those people go, who go to Malaysia, so they will not be sent back to a place of return, but also to guarantee and to ensure that they have access to processing as a refugee as they seek that asylum. Don't forget in Malaysia we will be setting up transit centres that we will be monitoring and managing with uh, the backing of the UNHCR. But let's just go to the fundamental question here about what is actually in this legislation. This legislation doesn't name Malaysia, you see. This legislation puts in process uh, uh, an ability for the executive government to have offshore processing. It doesn't name Nauru and it doesn't name Malaysia either. So the question still remains is whether if you as a party, as Nigel said, fundamentally believe offshore processing is the way to go, 
then what I think you need to do is now sit down and work constructively with us so that this is an amendment to the Act that is going to last for all time, no matter what party is in government federally. But the amendments don't, don't uh, need any legal backing in the third country for those protections. In, in your eyes, is that enough? Do you think if you were to stand in caucus and give your, your view on the amendments that they are enough protection? Well, I think what we need to be guaranteed is that within these 800 people are taken back to Malaysia, that they are afforded maximum protection we can possibly give them. And working with the UNHCR and working with the Malaysian government, who have made some significant changes in the last couple of weeks and months, as well as Nauru, I might say. So perhaps, you know, Australia is instrumental in actually changing what is happening in the region, which is where we started a couple of years back. Uh, we may well be guaranteed and may well be satisfied as we go through the course of discussions tonight and tomorrow that those concerns will be met. Nigel, are, are you attempting to, to be the government from, the, from opposition, attempting to limit the government's options, make, make the government do what you want? Not at all. We're in fact protecting some very good protections that were put in under Section uh, 198A of the Migration Act. And that provides for the particular protections that ensures not only non-reformant but the sort of level of amenity that countries that we're sending them would provide. And we've decided that uh, the best way to do this across the board would be that generally those issues are met by those people who are in fact sign signatories of, of the 51 Convention or the 67 Protocol. So I think it is, uh, if, if, that wasn't, if that wasn't sufficient argument for Australians, you'd have to say that continuing to pursue uh, the so-called Malaysian uh, five-to-one swap deal, I mean, we, we're taking 4,000, they're taking 800. We've already had over 1,000 arrive since they made the announcement and since the date that they were actually supposed to start counting, we're well over half. So by the time this debate finishes, that is not a solution. That's just another thought bubble. That's passed. And so uh, we're trying to put in place a long-term solution. Our amendments are serious amendments that allows the government to continue with offshore processing, still provide for the disincentives, and yet ensures that those right and proper protections for refugees are afforded to them. Trish, if, if the opposition continues to say no to the amendments you want, is it then time for the government to stop and rethink, either, either accept Nauru as a possibility or move to onshore processing only? Well, I've, I've not known this government to back away from hard policy issues. Uh, just, you know, the simple changes to the Fair Work Act, implementing that and getting rid of work choices. But if you can't tackling, get them through the parliament, but, if you don't have, but, have the numbers in the parliament, that's, that's the end of the game, also, isn't it? But tackling climate change is another policy challenge that we've also had. And there's one thing that this Prime Minister is absolutely fantastic at doing, and that is sitting down with parties and negotiating that. I mean, we had a discussion with Tony Abbott today, he's looking at further amendments to the legislation, and I know from her point of view and our point of view that won't be the end of the matter, uh, that she is very skilful in actually guiding a course here through what is a substantial policy decision. See, this legislation has to stand the test of time for offshore processing for either political party. I mean, if, if the opposition and Tony Abbott are going to say no to this piece of legislation, but they still want offshore processing, then I say, well, where's your draft legislation to put in place what you want? Now, as you're both senators... Well, we actually have, we've just provided that today. There has it, been the provision of a complete set of amendments to the legislation <laughs> that not only make sense, but are going to make some real change. If I could take the opportunity, because you're both from the Northern Territory, to talk for the few minutes we have left about Indigenous policy, Nigel, are there things in Indigenous policy that governments are getting right? Is there reason for hope? Look, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vast question. Uh, the gap is widening, and that isn't only to do with bad government. It is substantially to do with bad government. Uh, but the sort of issues in terms of whether you're talking about infrastructure, education, reconnection with in employment, uh, the gap's getting wider in all of those. And sadly, from a territorial point of view, for example, we have the situation where the Northern Territory Government have decided that only 33% of people uh, need to go to school if you're an Aboriginal person, but we want 98% uh, uh, of people to go to school if you're a, if you're a white person. Now, you know, that's just a racist and discriminatory policy that is a two-speed policy, and it's completely unacceptable in this day and age. And so w we need to clearly examine those policies that are sending us down the path of making the gap get wider. And unless we've all got to be pretty fair income about about the role we play in this, because any spin and oh look, this is just to make the numbers better. And why is it 33 percent? Because we know that's what it is. So that's what we'll make our target. It, there's just no place for that sort of really limp-wristed policy in these matters. We really need to be fair, and we're going to make some changes in here. 
Uh, well, I think, you know, I think you're wrong, Nigel. In some areas, I think the gap is closing and you just have to look at life expectancy and some of the Indigenous health uh, indicators. Uh, also, for the first time ever in the Northern Territory, we've had kids graduating in Year 12. Remember, under the CLP, there was no secondary education provided out bush. Under a Labor Northern Territory government, there is. But I think one of the biggest fundamental questions you have to ask when it comes to school education is why... Uh, people not sending their children to school. What is it, as an Indigenous person, that you find is, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, not palatable in terms of sending your child to school? Is the curriculum wrong? Is the is the atmosphere in the school wrong? Is is the delivery of the classes wrong? Or do you not fundamentally understand why it is that a child needs to go to school for 200 uh, days, you know, uh, in a semester and 400 days, uh, you know, over a course of a curriculum period? You know, it's based on child development and theories and do they not actually understand that there's a reason why you send your children to a school for a certain period of time each year in order to have that stepping stone and I think what we've done is fail to empower Indigenous people and fail to give them responsibility. They're going to make mistakes, certainly, but I certainly think what we need to do is hand the responsibility back to Indigenous people and support them in making the right decisions and in sometimes making the wrong decisions but let be Let's be there for them as they do that. Have the lessons over decades of money being spent and it not achieving its objective, are they being learnt? Well, well I suspect you? not. I mean, it, it's not about how much money it is. We've got to start measuring outcomes. It's like this, uh, the policy, we're going to spend $100 million on, on, on Indigenous smoking. Well, the $100 million, uh, it can hardly be a carefully thought out process to get to exactly $100 million. $100 million is the headline announcement to say we're doing something with Indigenous smoking rather than to sort of talk about these are the particular outcomes that we've got, these are so many people who smoke and a percentage of Indigenous people, we'll be doing these things to get that, to get that fixed. Now, if we keep talking about just how much money we spend uh, rather than speaking about real outcomes, uh, then again we'll say, well, what happened yesterday? Oh, we spent $100 million. Well, that means absolutely nothing. So again, the fundamentals about about our motive for change and, and if your motive is change to impress the wider population that you're doing something rather than actually doing something, policy will continue to fail. I don't think under us the emphasis has ever been on the amount of money. It's the emphasis you keep asking, how many dollars and what are we getting for our money? Our emphasis has always been about you know, reducing smoking rates in Indigenous communities. Everyone would be signing up to that. We've got to ask ourselves is how do we ensure Indigenous people sign up to that and they take ownership of programs that are going to reduce the smoking? How are they going to take ownership of a program that makes sure that every child is at school every day? Ownership to reduce the level of violence in their communities. At the end of the day, we could say, well, maybe it doesn't matter what it costs. Of course it matters what it costs. But sometimes you actually have to ensure, we're talking about regional and very remote communities here, and putting those policies in place is expensive. But the key fundamental issue is, what is the government doing to give people you know, the skills and the responsibility to make those decisions themselves. I'm sure we could talk about this issue for many minutes yet, but we've run out of time. Nigel Scullion and Trish Crossland, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thanks. And that's Capitol Hill for today. Please join us at the same time tomorrow.